March 31, a day when many things can go wrong. There could be some awkward situations brewing on this date. There are rumors that 27 states in America and five countries in Europe may experience three distinct issues. It's making people a little anxious. This is quite obvious because when you know something is coming but you know nothing about it, it will definitely scare you. And don't forget the world is already facing tough times in every aspect. Hey, but don't let it depress you. We have overcome obstacles in the past and always managed to overcome them. We can overcome everything that comes our way if we work together. So let's maintain our good attitude, watch out for one another, and have faith that everything will turn out perfectly. Because nothing can beat a positive attitude. Don't forget people with positivity can alter their destiny. And here, we are all together in this. Never forget that we are there for one another no matter what. So let's be friendly to each other, offer assistance, and strive to make today the best it can be. After all, there is nothing we can't handle if we have a little faith and a lot of love, right? Something significant could occur on March 31st. 13 American states and five European nations could face difficulties as a result of three distinct catastrophes. People were made aware of Pope Benedict XVI's parting remarks about what might happen around the end of March. We now impart this message to every one of you, dear children of our King, Jesus Christ. On a dark day, that is, March 31st, it is going to be a critical task to pay close attention to the sky. We should be ready for anything challenging that may come our way, since we don't know exactly what will happen or where it will come from. Because wrath has no shape and form, no one knows from where it is born. It just appears one day and destroys everything. Keeping the force's power in mind, we must all band together, remain vigilant, and prepare to safeguard any potentially affected areas. Because you never know, trying might help you a little. As per the Pope's prophecy, there will be three events. First, a red storm will go through, throwing brilliant colors across the sky. People will be anticipating something extraordinary, which will make them feel enthusiastic. Something unusual is about to happen when the storm gets near. Amazing stuff happens as the crimson storm moves. It turns the roads into something fascinating rather than demolishing them. Everybody's attention is drawn to the enigmatic energy that pulses through the regular channels. Vibrant red flowers blossom beside the roadsides, creating a captivating pathway that reflects the path of the storm. Curiosity quickly will give way to outright surprise. The residents of the town will be drawn to follow the red storm's route. Along the journey, these people will learn that the storm really brings about a unique form of rejuvenation rather than chaos. The unremarkable roads will then bear evidence of a remarkable journey, and the neighborhood will be brought together by this amazing feat. Next, get ready for an extremely spectacular treat. It is anticipated that 27 U.S. states and 5 European countries will experience a severe freeze. Yes, you heard that right. A unique occurrence marked by a widespread freeze that will cover everything in a glossy layer of frost is approaching as the seasons change. There is a sense of curiosity and mild concern about this major freeze among the local population. Towns are preparing for the approaching cold wave, while meteorologists keep a careful eye on these patterns. It is said to be more than simply a slight chill in the air, but rather a magnificent display of nature adorning everything with exquisite designs woven into the ice. The air will get colder, and the atmosphere will be charged with excitement as the big freeze day draws near. As everyone gets ready for the amazing transformation that is about to happen, families will stock up on necessities, offices, and schools will get ready for the cold, and towns and cities will come together as one. The day will come with a mild winter breeze, bringing this amazing occasion with it. Is it the right thing to call it an amazing occasion? Everything will turn colors of silver and white as a big sparkly frost slowly spreads. It will look like there is frost on the trees, and lakes will turn into large ice sheets. Sounds lovely, right? But this process is not natural. There are hidden meanings and punishments behind it. 
Changes are occurring within the church in the meantime, dear children of our King, Jesus Christ. Some of God's followers are becoming confused by these developments, which is leading them to lose faith and possibly quit the church. Sectarians, devil worshippers are taking advantage of this to mislead people, pointing them in the direction of murky waters that do not belong to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you are wondering, are we supposed to believe every prophecy done by the Pope to come true? Do we really need to believe this prophecy? Let's first know a little more about Pope Benedict, and you will gain the answer. Originally known as Joseph Alois Ratzinger, Benedict XVI was a prominent figure in the Catholic Church who, as Pope from 2005 to 2013, irrevocably altered its history. He was born in the small German town of Marktel am Inn on April 16, 1927, and had a life marked by a strong commitment to service, learning, and religion. Joseph Ratzinger showed a strong spiritual bent and a sharp intellect at a young age. He was ordained as a priest in 1951, marking the beginning of his journey into the priesthood. He obtained a doctorate in theology at the esteemed University of Munich, eager to learn more about theology. He graduated in 1953. His later contributions to Catholic theology would be firmly based on this scholarly foundation. Because of his academic achievements, Ratzinger was highly regarded as a theologian and lecturer who taught at several universities. But his power inside the church started to grow during the revolutionary years of the Second Vatican Council, 1962-1965. He promoted progressive changes meant to revitalize and rejuvenate Catholicism in the contemporary world while serving as an expert advisor to the council. When Ratzinger was named Archbishop of Munich in 1977, his religious career reached a new height. His promotion to the College of Cardinals was announced just three months later when he was given the Cardinal's hat. He established himself as a well-regarded theologian and a leader who was devoted to the Church's well-being during his time as Archbishop and then as a Cardinal. When Ratzinger was appointed Prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith in 1981 and served in that capacity until 2005, it was one of his most important responsibilities in the Church. In this capacity, he was responsible for maintaining theological consistency and doctrinal orthodoxy within the Catholic Church. Ratzinger was referred to as Pope John Paul II's Enforcer of Orthodoxy, because of his significant influence in determining the Church's position on a range of moral and theological matters while serving as his trusted confidant. Ratzinger's academic accomplishments and steadfast commitment to Church dogma prepared the way for him to become Pope. But when he assumed the name Benedict XVI and succeeded to the Pope throne in 2005, he inherited a Church beset by several difficulties. These difficulties included dwindling church attendance, a lack of new priests, disagreements within the church on its future, and the terrible fallout from a global sexual abuse scandal involving clergy members. Benedict XVI made it his mission to approach these issues during his pontificate by combining academic rigor, humility, and unshakable faith. He set out to bring the teachings of the church back to life and to rekindle the zeal of the faithful, for spirituality. His efforts were not without controversy, though, as some took issue with his handling of the sexual abuse epidemic and his conservative approach to doctrine. Benedict XVI, the first pope to do so in almost 600 years, took the extraordinary decision to step down from the papacy in 2013, citing worries about his deteriorating health and advanced age. His resignation shocked the Catholic community but also showed a deep humility and selflessness in prioritizing the interests of the Church over his own. Benedict XVI's decision to resign as Pope in February 2013 was one of the most significant occasions in his pontificate. This is a noteworthy occasion, as his obituaries correctly point out. It transformed the Pope from a perpetual monarchy into something more similar to an elected office with a fixed tenure which arouse a topic of debate amongst people. For subsequent popes, particularly his immediate successor, Pope Francis, who is already 86 years old, this choice established a precedent. 
Pope Francis has indicated that he might step down if he becomes too old or ill to continue. Another humble gesture was Benedict XVI's resignation. He realized that amid scandal and hardship, he was ill-equipped to head the Catholic Church, which has over 1.3 billion adherents. But Benedict's departure also revealed a crucial aspect of his personality, his propensity to state the negative unequivocally. He had a history of saying no to opportunities throughout his career, which may have had a significant effect on the church. This rejection of the Pope was consistent with this trend. Before his elevation to the Pope, Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger presided over the Vatican's doctrinal body, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, from 1981 to 2005. In this capacity, Benedict's style was frequently typified by his unwavering reluctance to allow candid dialogue on current matters inside the Catholic Church. Some contend that the difficulties the Church is currently facing are a result of this rigid doctrinal position. Throughout his tenure, Ratzinger wrote a great deal of books, showing that he was adamant about what was best for the Church. However, this self-assurance and his unwillingness to consider different opinions caused him to ignore a lot of difficult questions. In a 2000 biography, Vatican reporter John L. Allen, Jr. painstakingly detailed this process. Liberation theology was one of the first areas in which this firm position was adopted. Upon the Second Vatican Council, theologians in Central and South America, including Gustavo Gutierrez in Peru, Juan Luis Segundo in Uruguay, and Leonardo Boff in Brazil, reacted to the Council's exhortation to Catholics to read the signs of the times by fusing Marxist notions of an engaged working class with the liberation teachings of the gospel. Their strategy became popular in grassroots movements against authoritarian and corrupt regimes, many of which had historical ties to the Church, as well as in Catholic universities. The advent of liberation theology was swift and intricate, necessitating a careful reaction. But instead, aggressive action was taken by Ratzinger and the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, CDF. They began to look into Gutierrez, asked Boff for clarification, called liberation theology a heresy, and sent out a strong warning with a papal directive. This instruction denounced liberation theology as a perversion of the Christian doctrine that God had given the Church. Though criticism continued for the entire decade, these measures were implemented during Ratzinger's first three years at the CDF. The denial of liberation theology persisted even in the face of horrific incidents, such as the 1989 murders at the Central American University in El Salvador of six Jesuits, their housekeeper, and her daughter, by militant assassins. Father Ignacio Elacuria, a Jesuit who was assassinated, was a strong advocate of liberation theology. Ratzinger also made a noteworthy rejection of the matter of ordination, Many Catholics in the Church expressed a desire to re-evaluate the long-standing decree that only celibate men could serve as priests after Vatican II. Some suggested extending the duty of deacons to include women or allowing married men and women to be ordained. Ratzinger, however, vehemently disagreed with each of these recommendations. He moved swiftly to investigate University of Notre Dame theologian Father Richard P. McBrien, who had implied in his seminal work, Catholicism, that women's ordination was a subject up for debate. Additionally, Ratzinger stepped in to stop American bishops from consulting with women for a pastoral letter regarding women's roles in the Church. He also confirmed, alongside John Paul II, the infallibility of Church teaching regarding the reservation of ordination for men. So, the Pope took charge of the Church when nothing was in place and made all the amends to make things better. Out of all his understanding, learning, and faith, the Pope made this prophecy about how things might go against European nations, how nature might turn against these people, and how the U.S. might die due to their own wrongdoings. Therefore, a red storm is almost on the way to Glenwood, moving through a town at sunset, giving everything a warm glow, the sky turns red, and everyone gets excited because they know something special is coming. As we mentioned before, 
Though the whole warm, glowing thing sounds scary instead of causing damage, this storm can fascinatingly change things. The roads it travels on don't get ruined. Instead, they seem to come alive with a mysterious energy. Bright red flowers start blooming along the roads, creating a beautiful trail that matches the storm's path. People start following this trail and realize it's not a bad thing. It feels like a fresh start, making everything feel new and exciting. It brings the community together as they witness this amazing sight. The another event that will happen on a dark day will come out of the wind. A big freeze will happen, like the one that happened in Israel some days before. That destroyed everything in a couple of minutes. Everyone has started getting ready for the big blow, buying extra stuff they need and preparing for the cold. Why not? When you know something is coming your way, you should be prepared for it. When it finally arrives, everything turns white and silver as a gentle winter breeze blows through. While all this is happening, changes are going on in the church that confuse some people. Due to the imbalance, some people have started questioning everything. They are losing faith and leaving the church because of it. In these testing times, people are moving away from their roots to find answers to the questions that they could have found in their roots. As a consequence of this big situation, people on the other side. That is, people who do not have faith. The people who lie on the side of Antichrist are taking advantage of this confusion, leading others away from the right path, and giving rise to the times no one wants in their life or in their loved ones' lives. But even in these tough times, we can trust in God's power to bring calmness to the chaos. Just like it says in Psalm 107, 29, God can calm even the wildest storms. So, let's hold on to our faith and trust that God will guide us through whatever comes our way. Because He always does, and He is the one with the better plan for us. His plans have never brought any harm to us, our race, the human race is moving further despite all the rolling stones and potholes in our way. Trust us when we are sharing the news with you. That is not the end, but the beginning of such hailstorms. There is more to come and more to see. Now that you know how things might turn out on the day, please take a moment to share this video with as many people as you can in order to ensure that they are aware of it. Together, let's pray and wish for the best. In case you agree, put Amen. By strengthening and consoling you, your prayers might help you feel a part of something greater than yourself. We hope you find comfort and serenity in your quiet moments of contemplation. Let's approach anything that comes our way with kindness and bravery. As a team, we can conquer any obstacle. Together, let's pray for a moment. Jesus, you have my faith. I hold that you are the Son of God and that you died on the cross to deliver me from the grip of sin and death. I've returned to the Father because of you. I decided to turn away from anything in my life that doesn't honor you, including my wrongdoings and selfishness, today. Jesus, you are my choice. I fully commit myself to you. I come to you for forgiveness and beg that you become my Lord and Savior. Please engulf my heart with your life and love and help me to emulate your loving nature. Permit your presence to radiate from me. God, I am so grateful for everything. I ask in the name of Jesus. Indeed, I give you everything I have, Lord Jesus Christ. My will, my freedom, my memories, and my understanding. I give all that I value to you. Jesus, the Lord, I give everything over to you. Please use your grace, love, and will to lead me. I have more than enough blessings from you. I make no further requests. Indeed, but have no fear, I will protect you, I love you, and I bless you. According to Psalm 107, 29, He hushed the waves of the sea, He stilled the storm to a whisper. This verse serves as a reminder of God's ability to bring peace and serenity to storms. Put our faith in His heavenly scheme. So, here we come to the end of this journey. Let's see what the future holds for us. Never forget to put in faith and devotion towards Him because He will handle it all in the end. If you enjoyed watching the video, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel. See you soon in the next video.